Hey guys, uh, I decided to do one last uh, Magic Origins limited review video before it becomes available on Magic Online uh, this weekend. Some of you may have already drafted um, it a few times uh, in paper, um, but I just wanted to do one last limited review video before it, you know, the format becomes a regular thing for all of us. Um, and the one I wanted to do this time is another top 10 list. I talked at a top 10 rares and mythics you want to open list. Um, I've also done reviews of all of the various um, colors and all the various archetypes as well. Um, but in this one, I just wanted to do the top 10 awful cards that will try to trick you in Magic Origins Limited. Um, and the next uh, slide will explain what I mean by that exactly. Um, this list doesn't include cards that are pretty clearly not good and limited. Um, we have our infinite obliteration, you know, a cranial extraction type effect. Those are just never very good and limited. Um, it just has a negligible effect. It has no effect on the board, actually, and has a negligible effect on the game. I mean, if your opponent has a really huge bomb creature and you name it and you get rid of it, um, that's great, but they may not have drawn it anyway, and you may have had removal for it anyway. Um, it's just not good and limited. It was printed for, with constructed in mind, surely, as a way of breaking up um, certain combos, maybe like Splinter Twin and things like that. Um, also doesn't include things like Hallowed Moonlight, um, which is, you know, another card that was printed explicitly with limited in mind I mean with excuse me with constructed in mind and it's one in a white until end of turn if a creature would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast exile it instead draw a card um, that's almost never going to come up in this format um, there are a few cards there's one card I think that revives creatures from the graveyard and there's a mythic rare and a rare in black that can both um, well, no, only one of them comes back to the battlefield. So there's only one card I can think of that comes back to the battlefield, like, straight up. Um, so it's not especially useful. There's also, I guess, Dragon Fodder. It stops tokens as well, but it's not worth running, you know, unless your opponent has, like, eight Dragon Fodders in their deck, um, and it's basically a counter spell that cycles itself for that, but that's probably not going to happen. Um, these cards just aren't playable, um, and neither is Alhamerit's Archive, probably the most obviously of all. It's a mythic for five mana, and if you would gain life, you gain twice that much life instead. If you would draw a card, except the first one you draw in each of your draw steps, draw two cards instead. So it's just not, um, you know, you're all rarely going to gain life in this format. You will sometimes, and you're rarely going to draw extra cards in this format. Um, so it's not good um, and limited. I don't really see it having a place in, like, tier one constructed either, though it does seem like a fun card to build around and a fun, like, EDH card. So I show you these cards to say that the cards that are on this list are cards that look sort of like they might be playable, but I want to argue aren't especially playable. Um, these three cards here, um, and I probably missed a few, are, are not playable, but they also don't seem especially playable um, and limited. Uh, they're clearly printed with other formats in mind, um, so I would say don't play these either. Um, there's a good chance Hallowed Moonlight ends up being worth a lot, though, so first picking it if you're interested in the value uh, seems like a good idea. I imagine it'll be, Hallowed Moonlight will be in, like, many a sideboard um, once uh, Magic Origins is in standard, which is pretty soon. Um, so I have a top ten list, but I also have a couple of dishonorable mentions, honorable mentions, whatever you want to call them, um, and they are Bellows Lizard and Mantle of Webs. I think Bellows Lizard sort of embodies a common problem uh, people have when sort of evaluating cards in Limited, um, and that is that they see a 1 mana 1 1 and he has its stuff in his text, so that means he's above, you know, what you'd expect from a 1 mana creature. Um, and I guess that's true. The problem is 1 mana creatures are pretty irrelevant in Limited, um, and they become irrelevant really quickly. This one will too. Um, you know, he can trade, I guess, with things, but only if you keep investing mana in him. There aren't very many one toughness creatures that are going to trade with him. Um, and he may swing once for one damage, or maybe even twice for two damage. Um, but it's just not worth it. Like, you have to think about, when you're thinking about limited, you have to think about the value of a card through the entire game. Um, and if you draw this guy late, he's near completely useless, other than being a chump blocker. Um, and if you play him early, his effect is also pretty negligible, as he'll quickly be outclassed by, you know, a two-drop that's bigger than he is, and that to trade for it, you have to invest another two mana into him and put yourself behind on board. Um, and that's just not very good. Um, and that's, as I said, is a common problem with many one-drops in Limited. Uh, there's many one-drops that just aren't especially playable um, in Limited. The ones that are are things like Typhoid Rats, who has Death Touch and will trade with absolutely anything, 
or um, Shambling Goblin who can trade up no matter what. Uh, you know, he's a 1-1, one, one, one mana 1-1 one, one who can trade for something with two toughness because he gives minus 1, minus 1 to something when he dies um, without any investment of mana. So he's a decent 1-drop, especially in the exploit decks in Dragons of Tarkir. And Bellows Lizard isn't either of those. He's just an awful card, and I would beseech you to never play it um, if you can help it. I guess if you're really low on creatures and you really need, you know, some low drops and to lower your curve, and maybe it'll make it into your deck, but it really shouldn't. You should do whatever you can to avoid playing Bellows Lizards. Um, and the next one is Mantle of Webs. Um, I'm not high on most auras in general. Um, the problem with auras is how it's super easy to get yourself two for one. Um, if your opponent has mana untapped, you basically can't play your auras um, confidently without thinking you might get two for one. Um, you know, you can't like play Mantle of Webs. Um, when your opponent's untapped and then they just remove the creature you target with it and then you easily get two for one I mean that's the kind of thing your opponent's just waiting for to punish you with um, and even if they are tapped out um, once Mantle of Webs goes on your creature you can still get pretty easily two for one when they use a removal spell later so and the effect for for an aura to be playable it either has to replace itself um, and there are a number of those in this format um, Knightly Valor being one of them it makes a knight token so even if your creature with the Knightly Valor equipped to it, or enchanting it, dies, um, everything, you know, you still get to keep a 2-2 Knight token. Um, there's also the black enchantment that's one in a black and gives your guy plus 2 plus 0, and it gets, whenever this creature dies, draw a card. Those all replace themselves, um, and Mantle of Webs doesn't do that at all. Um, it gives your creature a pretty negligible bonus. Um, reach can be useful at times, um, but... It's just a really negligible bonus, plus one, plus three, and reach isn't going to help you a whole lot, um, especially because you're opening yourself up to an easy two-for-one on removal, or even if you're just forced to block with this creature, you get two-for-one. Um, and even if you're trading, I mean, you get two-for-one. If you have to block with it, you might get two-for-none. You know, your opponent may not lose anything, and you're just blocking. So it's just it's just not very good. Um, the, only, the only place I could see siding this in is if you're going against an opponent who has tons of flyers, and very little removal. Then you may want to side in Mantle of Webs. Um, it's a little more playable than Bellows Lizards in that sense, I guess, as I would never side in a Bellows Lizard. But uh, Mantle of Webs, I would side in, like if I was playing, like I said, opponent with tons of flyers and almost no removal. Um, that way you're not in danger of getting two for one, and the, the reach bonus is more important that way. All right, so we're going to move into the actual top ten list, and we're going to start with Prism Ring. Um, this card, I think people are going to want to try to shove into their artifact decks, the, the blue-red artifact deck, um, and it's, you know, it is an artifact. It's one mana. You get to choose a color. Whenever you cast a spell of the chosen color, you gain one life. Now, that might sound pretty good because, you know, how much life is this going to gain you in the whole game? But, you know, and the answer is hard to determine, but it's probably something like five or six, maybe more, depending on your deck. But the problem is, in Limited, you're almost always playing a two-color deck. Uh, sometimes a three-color deck, though, I think that's doubtful in Magic Origins because there's so little fixing. So not even all your spells are going to trigger your Prism Ring. Um, and the gaining of one life is a pretty negligible effect. Um, it's just not enough to really help you out in the long run. Uh, if you and your opponent are both in heavy into one color, maybe Prism Ring will help you gain a lot of life. Um, but it's still a pretty negligible effect. Um, I'd say even if you're dead, you're desperate for artifacts. I'd rather run, um, you know, a one mana artifact that th there's the one mana artifact that makes a creature unable to block, and when it comes into play, draws you a card, and it's much better than Prism Ring. Um, is I just I would never play Prism Ring even in an artifact deck. Usually these sorts of effects, like, you know, the Staff of the Mind Mages and stuff from Magic 2015, um, just are really negligible effects. Um, the gaining of life sounds good, but it's just not enough to matter. Um, even siding this in against a really aggressive deck isn't a great idea. You need to be gaining a lot more than one life a turn to stave off an aggressive deck. And that's about all you're going to be gaining with Prism Ring, even if things are going really well. Um, and you don't want to waste a card on that in the early game when it could have been a creature that could block or trade or a removal spell or something like that. Okay, so that's Prism Ring. Next on the list of, you know, cards that might look playable but I don't think are at all is Psychic Rebuttal. Um, it is one in a blue and it says counter target instant or sorcery spell that targets you. And then it has Spell Mastery. If there are two or more instant and or sorcery cards in your graveyard, you may copy the spell counter this way. You may choose new targets for the copy. 
Um, this sounds pretty good in that you know you're thinking about spells that, but you're thinking about spells that can target you. But the problem is there just aren't that many of them in this format. Um, there's a few burn spells that can target you. Uh, one of them is rare. Um, it's uh, Exquisite Firecraft, and the other one is Lightning Javelin. Um, and there, that's about it, really. There's not a whole lot more burn that's actually going to be targeting you. I guess if you play an opponent who's packing, like, three Lightning Javelins and two Exquisite Firecrafts, this might be something worth thinking about. Um, but there's really not enough instant or sorcery spells that target you to make this worth playing. Even though it's a hard counter, which seems attractive, um, I really don't think it is. So I would just say don't play Psychic Rebuttal. It looks like it might have some useful effects um, for your deck, but it's just... Um, I just don't think it does. Um, and I would avoid playing it. Like I said, maybe you sided in against an opponent who somehow got multiples of a rare and is running three lightning javelins but that's about the only place i could see that happening um it's just not a very good card so don't play it um number eight on our list is murder investigation um it is another aura that has the inherent disadvantages of auras which are that if you try to put it on your dude and your opponent has mana untapped um they can two for one you the one thing about this one is even after they if they kill the creature um you will be able to get a few soldier creature tokens after they kill it, um, but they're all 1-1s, one which isn't especially large. I mean, you could theoretically swarm your opponent, and I think that's why this card's kind of a trap. People will think you can actually, it'll actually be good most of the time, but I'd say most of the time it's just not going to be. Um, you don't want to put this on, like, your 2-2. Two -two. That's not really enough of a, enough of, enough soldiers to get um, in, you know, when your creature dies. It's just not a big enough effect. Um, you're going to be holding this in your hand for a long time before you put it on a big creature. And even then, your, your opponent will try to play around it, um, either by, you know, flying over or, you know, forcing you to block um, at times where just forcing you to block and lose your creature and get soldiers. Once the, the board is so stable that a bunch of 1-1 one, one white soldiers, even three or four of them, isn't a big deal. I would say the one place I could see this card actually being somewhat playable, um, or as the other cards I've talked about weren't, is if you're in a black-white deck and you end up with like a few Nantuko Husks. Um, but even then, it's not incredible. Like you could put it on one of your creatures you're going to sacrifice, and that gives you even more food for your Husk to try to like break through for it, for the damage you need to win. But even there, the effect isn't big enough um, to cost you a card in your deck. And as I said, it has the aura, the inherent problem of auras where you basically have to wait until your opponent's tapped out or you risk getting two for ones um, when they destroy the creature you're trying to enchant. So I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, don't play Murder Investigation. I know it looks like it could be useful. It makes your guy uh, replace itself, but it's just not a big enough effect. Um, you know, in, in Limited where you're not going to know whether or not you're going to get a big enough creature for the Murder Investigation to be relevant enough. And you're not sure if you're going to get two for one or not, uh, which is pretty likely. Um, and the seventh card on our list is Vine Snare. Um, it's two and a green for prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn by creatures with power four or less. Now this card, I, the first time I looked at it, I actually thought it might be some somewhat playable. Because you can trick your opponent into... Um, you, not trick your opponent, but you can attack with, say, all your guys with power four or more. And then you can vine snare and kill all their guys when they when they block. But then I realized, you know, and this is the trap this card creates. They're not going to be blocking. Like even if they're blocking the guys, and my guys have more than four power, and their guys don't, chances are all of their creatures are going to die anyway, and my creatures will all survive anyway. On the flip side of that, my opponent's not going to be attacking into all my creatures with more than four power when I have. Um, a, they're not going to be attacking into them in general. Um, because it's just a bad idea when I have a bunch of creatures with more than four power and theirs all have less than four power. Um, it could be useful if there were like a token swarm deck in this format, but there's really not a really big one like that. Um, and that way it could be, I guess, sort of a fog effect and buy you some time. But fog effects are usually not very playable anyway, unless you have an opponent who, who's running like a lot of uh, trumpet blast effects where, you know, fogging puts them down a card, and it made their alpha strike do absolutely nothing. But it's just not very good. Like, it'd be better if it was just fog. Like, if it just said prevent all combat damage, period, you know, the way fog did, it would be much better than vine snare, which is limited. Like, you know, if your opponent's swinging at you with a bunch of, um, 
you know, two twos or three twos because they've been pumped by something like, uh, you know, a board effect that pumps everybody. Um, and they're also swinging with an 8-8, eight, eight, you know, the, the Vine Snare is not going to do anything about the 8-8. Eight, eight. So it's just too limited, too narrow of a card. I don't think it's good enough to warrant being in your deck um, ever, really. Um, and I would completely avoid Vine Snare at all costs. Uh, don't m make the mistake of thinking it's playable. Uh, next on our list, we have Tormented Thoughts. Um, this is two and a black as a sorcery, and as additional cast to sacrifice to cast tormented thoughts, you have to sacrifice a creature. And target player discards a number of cards equal to the sacrificed creature's power. Now this sounds like it would be okay, but it's just a huge cost to pay to not have a direct effect on the board. In fact, you're putting yourself behind on board by casting this. Um, if you're already ahead on your opponent, I guess it's okay. But we again need to think about you know all aspects of the game. If you draw this when you're behind, it's pretty useless um, and if you draw this when you're ahead the effect can be pretty negligible um, so there's really no point in using tormented thoughts um, I can see this maybe making it into one of the black red decks um, if this black red deck has a ton of well, not a ton but like four acts of treason then maybe you run tormented thoughts but there are way better outlets for sacrifice and tormented thoughts and fiery conclusion and then tuco husk um, among others those are both way better ways to, you know, act of treason your opponent's creature and then kill it than Tormented Thoughts is um, because the other ways affect the board. Fiery Conclusion, you can sack their creature um, and then hit another one of their creatures for five. Um, and then Tupo Husk can get big enough to break through for lethal or a big chunk of damage anyway. And so Tormented Thoughts, even in the black-red deck, isn't especially good. Even if you get all the sacrifice outlets, I mean, yeah, all the ways to steal their creatures possible. It's just not very good. Um, a lot of the time, it's, you know, maybe it's a mind rot, maybe it's a little more, but it's going to be hard to make it work. Um, so I wouldn't think that, I don't think that Tormented Thoughts is especially playable, so I'd say avoid it. Next up, we have Healing Hands. Um, this is two and a white for target player gains four life. Draw a card. Um, this, I think, is sort of a trap because I think people look at it and they think, well, it's gaining me life and it's replacing itself, meaning it gives me, you know, kind of more time to play whatever card I drew and to set up my plan. So maybe in a control deck it would be okay. Um, and maybe that's true, and I, th I would think it was true if it were an instant. If it were an instant, like that's, you know, how big of an effect card types have. If this were an instant, it would probably not be on this list at all. I would say it's at least borderline playable if it were an instant. Um, because you could just leave your mana up and cast it on your opponent's turn, especially if you're holding like a counter spell or removal in your hand at instant speed too. And if they decide not to do anything to try to play around whatever you're untapped for, you could just healing hands and punish them a little bit. But it's a sorcery and it's just not, you know, you spend, if you're actually casting this on turn three, you basically just spent a turn not affecting the board at all. Um, and, you know, you do gain four life and draw a card and that's, you know, at least that's something, but it's not enough. Um, there are way better things you could be doing on turn three. And then if you draw this late game, uh, whether you're ahead or behind, the effect is almost insignificant, is insignificant, more or less. Um, so I, this is another one where when you think about all aspects of the game, even when it's at its best, which is when you're ahead, there are better, much better things you could do when you're ahead than play a healing hand. Playing a creature, for instance, would be way better than playing healing hands or a removal spell, both of which would help you win um, while you're ahead. And Healing Hands just doesn't help you do any of that. Um, all right, so number four on our list is a rare. I think it's the first rare that's actually been in the top ten. And it is Talent of the Telepath. Um, it's two and two blue. Target opponent reveals the top seven cards of his or her library. You may cast an instant or sorcery card from among them without paying its mana cost. Then that player puts the rest into his or her graveyard. Then it has Spell Mastery. If there are two or more instant and or sorcery cards in your graveyard, you may cast up to two revealed instant and or sorcery cards instead of one. Um, the problem with this card is that despite the name of the card, you don't have telepathy and you don't necessarily know what's in your opponent's deck. And your opponent doesn't even know what the top seven cards of their deck is either. Seven is just not deep enough to go to know that you're always going to hit something you can cast for free. And in addition to that, there's just, like, depending on what you hit, it may be completely useless depending on the board state. Um, you know, if you really need to hit a removal spell, whether you're ahead or behind, I guess that's a talent of the telepath can be pretty good. But you could also just be playing a removal spell. That's the point. Like, if you could just play a removal spell, that's much better than playing Town of the Telepath, which is putting chance in hand, and, you know, putting the game in the hands of chance, and you may not get to play 
uh, any removal spell, um, or you may hit something that's completely useless to you at that specific point in the game, um, and you just can't know what you're going to hit with Talent of Tele Telepath. And on top of that, like Healing Hands, this is a sorcery, so if you're playing this, no matter at what point of the game, a four mana investment to potentially do nothing or to potentially hit a card that has a negligible effect on the field um, is just bad. So, you know, I'd rather have removal in my deck every day instead of having Talent of the Telepath. If Talent of the Telepath could maybe hit auras too, it might be a little better um, because there's, you know, we have Claustrophobia and Suppression Bonds in this format, and those are some pretty common removal spells um, that if you could hit those two, it'd be nice. There are also some playable Enchant Creature auras. Um, then maybe it would be a little better, but it can't, um, and it still wouldn't be that great even if it did that. This card makes you feel like you can, you know, screw your opponent over by, you, um, you know, using the, the cards in their library and, you know, milling them a little bit at the same time, but it's just too, too little of an effect, especially at sorcery speed. All right, so that takes us to a Crow and Jailer, who has the same problem, basically, as Bellows Lizard. He's a one-mana 1-1 one, one with, with the text box, which makes people often think that that's good because it's better than nothing. Uh, I mean, better than just a one-mana 1-1. One, one. But he has the same sort of problem where, if no matter when you draw him, his effect isn't going to be huge. Um, his effect is a powerful one. Tapping a creature can be pretty powerful, but the amount of mana you have to invest in him is just, it's just too much. Plus, he has to tap as well, which is usually the case. Um, I mean, the one thing about him is he's actually probably better late game than he is early game. I mean, early game, you're not ever going to have time really to use his tap target creature ability. You're just going to be trying to curve out and stuff. Late game, if you get him, he's actually a little better than some one drops because he can help you get through for damage. Um, but he's also incredibly vulnerable as a 1-1. One, one. And even late game, having to use 3 mana up every turn to tap a creature is a pretty big investment. Um, you can do it at the end of your opponent's turn at least, but I just don't think I don't think he has a big enough effect. Um, you know, the fact that he's a 1-drop is almost unimportant because the time he's best is the late game. Um, I would compare him to Dramoka Dunecaster, who ended up being pretty underwhelming in um, Dragons of Tarkir draft. It was the... One mana zero two, who for one and a white could tap target creature without flying. Um, and this guy has one less toughness and one more power, and he costs one more to tap anything uh, instead of just creatures without flying. But that's, you know, Dramoka Doomcaster's effect was frequently really negligible, um, and a Crow and Jailer's will be too. Just having that much mana available to try to tap things down is um, it's just, it's just too much to ask, especially in the early game. And in the late game, there are much better things you could be doing with your mana. Um, like playing a creature, a three mana creature is often going to be better than tapping an opponent's creature unless you're trying to win on an alpha strike or playing a removal spell um, or just, you know, any creature that's better than a crow and jailer, which is most of them. Um, all right, so on to number two, we have Reclaim. Um, and this card, I think, puts is a trap because... Well, first of all, I'll say what it does, even though you can see it. It's one green at instant speed to put target card from your graveyard on top of your library. So if you have some really sweet bomb in your deck, you know, you can get it back and put it on top of your library with Reclaim, you know, a bomb that got killed or a, a removal spell you really need. And Reclaim seems like it would be pretty good because you can put a card from your graveyard on top of your library. But the problem with it is, is it doesn't actually even put it in your hand. Like you're paying one green mana, you're using up a card, and you're not even getting the card into your hand. Um, it is instant speed, so if you do it at the end of your opponent's turn, you'll draw that card, but it's still not, you're not really gaining a card. You're, you're spending a card to get one card. And it, there has to be something in your library worth getting. That's, I mean, graveyard worth getting. Uh, again, when we think about all stages of the game, Reclaim is pretty useless in the early game. Um, you're not going to be able, you know, you're going to have to have something worth getting back in your graveyard in the early game. That's almost never the case. Um, and you don't, you'd rather have another creature uh, or, you know, then get, reclaim your two drop from your graveyard. Uh, you know, you'd rather play like a three drop on turn three. Um, and reclaim's effect is just really negligible um, in that sense. Um, and in the late game, it can be good. That's one of the places, I guess it's much better in the late game. But even then, um, you know, getting a card from your graveyard on top of your library isn't as powerful as it sounds. You then have to spend all, you know, the mana recasting the spell. Um, and if it got, you know, if it's a big bomb and it got killed once, it may get killed again. And Reclaim's effect just isn't good enough. You have to have something good in your graveyard is a problem with it. Um, and I just wouldn't play this in my deck ever um, in Limited. It's just, it's just not, the, not the right costs um, for what it does. There aren't enough spells and, and creatures that you can get back that are relevant enough with Reclaim. 
that'll be in your graveyard often enough, um, and that's why I would never play uh, Reclaim. And our number one card is another green card and another rare, and it's Honored Hierarch. Um, he's another one mana 1-1, one, one, and he has a lot of text in his text box. His text box says, uh, Renown 1, first of all, uh, which is, if you didn't know, that new mechanic where if a creature deals combat damage to a player, if it isn't renowned, you put a plus one plus one counter on it and it becomes renowned. And then he also has, as long as he's renowned, it has vigilance and tap to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Now, this sounds really good, but as again, the same problems all one drops have um, in this format, uh, in limited, um, in that if you think about him at any stage of the game, but the very early game, He's completely useless. He's never going to get through for the one damage you need him to. The mana he produces is irrelevant. Um, and he's no Elvish Mystic or Lana War Elves who can always produce mana. Elvish Mystic and Lana War Elves were always playable because they're one mana, one ones, who could produce mana no matter what. Honored Hierarch will only produce the mana if he hits the opponent. So if you play him almost any time later than turn two, your opponent's just not going to let him through. Um, you could use tricks to try to get through or other things, but you're spending cards to get the effect, um, and that probably cancels out how beneficial his effect is. I have, to, I mean, I do admit that if you're, you're on the play, you play him on turn one, chances are your opponent's not going to be able to stop him, and then you're suddenly going to be at three mana and have a 2-2 on the table. So if you play him on turn one, he can be very good. Um, but that's a big if. Any later than that, and his value quickly plummets, you know, it plummets from being very good to being insignificant, um, you know, by turn three or four, probably. So he's just not worth putting into your deck, um, unless you desperately need a one drop for whatever reason, or, you know, you need more low curve creatures to try to stall you and get you to the late game. But that's not really, none of the archetypes that have green in it are really about that. Um, so that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So the Honored Hierarch, I think, is the biggest trap of all of these cards, the biggest problem because you'll look at it and see all the text in his text box as a 1-1. One, one. That's why it's number one on my list is because I think he's the biggest trap. And you think that the effect is really powerful, but it, and it is, but only on turn, basically only if you play him on turn one and only if you're on the play. If you're on the draw, um, your opponent may drop a two drop and it's likely they do on turn two. There's lots of two drops in this format and then your honored hierarch is just stuck high and dry and will never get renowned. So um, maybe, maybe you side him in um, into your deck when you're on the play. Um, you know, say you uh, lost game one, maybe side him in for game two. Um, but even then, it's a little risky because if you draw him at any point other than the very early, or very early game, he, he's just awful um, and useless, you know, basically. So that's what I think the top traps, the top uh, awful cards that will sort of try to trick you into thinking they're playable when you're drafting or playing sealed R in Magic, the Magic Origins uh, limited format. Um, let me know what you think about my picks. Let me know if you think I put something on here that you think is playable or if I left out some other awful card. I'm, I'm sure I did. There are a few more, um, but I didn't want to include too many. Um, these are the ones that I think are the biggest traps and the most uh, problematic and, you know, that they look like they might be playable, but they just aren't. So anyway, thanks for watching and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.